listening to bostonfreeradio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. And I'm glad you could join me for the show where I'll be reviewing five new movies for you for this week. First, though, I'm going to get into my normal segment, What's Topping the Box Office. This is the first segment on my show, every show, where I review or rather go through the top ten highest grossing movies of this past weekend. Whether they're hits, whether they're flops, I will let you know. But the movie that snagged the number one spot this week actually dethroned Avengers Infinity War, which I actually didn't expect it to do, but at the same time, it's a pretty big comic book movie, so I'm not entirely surprised. But regardless, Avengers Infinity War still cleaned up, but that's number two at the box office this week. Number one is Deadpool 2 which grossed a very impressive $125.5 million at the U.S. box office just this weekend, and a total worldwide of $300.4 million, and that's against a budget of $110 million. So, Deadpool 2 is immediately a tentative hit here in the States, but I would not be surprised to see it certified by next week. I also wouldn't be surprised to see it also at number one next week. But, of course, it's going against the new Star Wars movie, Solo, a Star Wars story. And I'll get more into that on my later segment of the show, What's Coming Up Next. But Deadpool is number one this week. It may hold the number one spot until Memorial Day weekend, but, of course, we'll have to see next week. Avengers Infinity War went down a peg, but this week it grossed $29.5 million at the U.S. box office, but against a budget of $316 to $400 million, somewhere in that range, Avengers Infinity War so far grossed $29.5 million. Excuse me. It has grossed so far in its four weeks $595.8 million just in the United States, Around the world, it has grossed a staggering $1.82 billion around the world in just one month. That is incredible. I don't, I mean, I do know how they do it. They have Disney behind them and they have a lot of advertising revenue. But rest assured, Avengers Infinity War is a certified hit here in the States. Actually, it's a tentative hit here in the States, but it's most definitely certified around the world. Book Club is a movie that did not stand a chance against either Deadpool or Avengers Infinity War, but still did pretty well for itself given its budget and its subject matter. Book Club grossed $13.6 million in its debut week against a budget of $10 million. And while I don't have the international numbers for you, I will say that Book Club is a tentative hit here in the States. Whether or not it's certified around the world, I don't know. Maybe it is, but either way, I'm moving on. Life of the Party, which was number two at the box office when it debuted last week, dropped to number four this week, having grossed $7.6 million at the U.S. box office. Against a budget of $30 million, Life of the Party has so far grossed $30.9 million here in the States and $36.8 million worldwide. So it wasn't expected to do nearly as well as Deadpool 2 or Avengers Infinity War, but right now it is a tentative hit here in the States and around the world. Breaking In is number five at the box office this weekend, sliding from number three last week. This weekend it grossed $6.8 million. Against a budget of just $6 million, Breaking In has so far grossed $29.1 million at the U.S. box office. I don't have the international numbers for you for this movie, but Breaking In is already, given its budget, a certified hit here in the States, and vicariously it is a certified hit around the world. Show Dogs is number six at the box office this weekend, making its debut this week, having grossed just $6 million. I don't have the budget for you for this movie, but I can tell you that it made $6 million at the U.S. box office and $7.7 million at the international box office. And so I can't tell you what kind of hit it is. It seems like a flop and not off to a very good start, but again, I don't know for sure. Overboard, in its third week in release, is number seven at the box office this weekend, sliding from number four last week, having grossed $4.6 million at the U.S. box office this weekend. Against a relatively low budget of $12 million, Overboard has so far grossed $5.5 
$36.9 million in the United States and $49 million worldwide. So again, like Life of the Party, this movie hasn't grossed nearly as much as Deadpool 2 or Avengers Infinity War, but because of its low budget, it is already a certified hit here in the States and around the world, so very good for that movie. A Quiet Place. I'll just tell you right off the bat, this is a certified hit. It fell quicker than Avengers Infinity War, but then again, it's been out longer than Avengers Infinity War, and was the number one movie at the box office from the time it was released up until Avengers Infinity War was released. But even though it grossed $3.9 million this past weekend, against a budget of just $17 million, A Quiet Place has so far grossed $176.1 $176.1 million at the U.S. box office and $296.5 million worldwide. So that means because it has grossed more than 10 times its budget just in the United States, A Quiet Place is indeed a certified hit here in the States and around the world. And I would not actually be surprised to see this movie come up again come Oscar season this coming January or February, but that is a long way away. So I'm not going to, I'm just going to put that prediction aside and move on because a lot could happen between now and January. Rampage is number nine at the box office this weekend, having grossed $1.6 million at the U.S. box office this weekend, which isn't very much, but against a budget of $120 million, Rampage has so far grossed $92.5 million here in the States and $407.4 million worldwide. So while it is not a hit of any kind here in the States and probably never will be, Rampage is actually a certified hit around the world. So very good for that movie as well. And finally, at number 10, the Amy Schumer comedy I Feel Pretty in its fifth week in release. It's number 10 at the box office this weekend, sliding from number six last week. And I Feel Pretty grossed $1.3 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $32 million, I Feel Pretty has so far grossed $46.6 million at the U.S. box office and $65.7 million worldwide. So while I Feel Pretty is a tentative hit in the United States, it is surprisingly just reached the certified mark around the world, and I didn't actually expect it to do so because I wasn't sure about Amy Schumer's international appeal, but as the numbers suggest, she probably has some. I'm probably okay to have one more drink before I drive home. I'm probably okay. I open the window to stay alert. Probably okay. I just popped some gum in my mouth. Step out of the car, please. I probably made a mistake. Probably okay isn't okay when it comes to drinking and driving. If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzzed driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. Your favorite Boston Free Radio artists will be taking over the airwaves to bring you new and original content. Don't hold your tongue. An SMC Speak Out, Sunday, June 10th from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. 12 straight hours of live performances, comedy, music, visual art, and more. Find out more and donate now online at somervillemedia.org. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on Boston Free Radio, watching on Somerville Community, excuse me, Somerville Community Access Television, or some community TV station around the country that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast. And to them, I say a special thank you. Or you're watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, this time on my own personal page, because we've had some technical difficulties with airing this on the Boston Free Radio Facebook page. But either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you should come as no surprise to anyone. It is Deadpool 2, the number one movie at the box office this weekend, which pulled in some very impressive numbers, especially given that it is an R-rated movie. But it's an R-rated comic book movie, not to mention the sequel to a very beloved movie that came out two years ago. I wasn't crazy about the original, but I did appreciate some things about it. But this time, foul-mouthed mercenary mutant Wade Wilson, a.k.a. Deadpool, is back. And he brings together a team of fellow mutants called the X-Force to separate themselves from the X-Men, who are part of 
Deadpool Cinematic Universe to protect a young boy with supernatural abilities from the brutal time-traveling cyborg, Cable. So here's what Deadpool 2 has in common with Avengers Infinity War. They're both out in the box office this weekend. They are both guaranteed to break box office records. They are both based on Marvel comic book characters, and they also have Josh Brolin playing the villain. Yep, Josh Brolin is in this movie playing Cable, just as he was in Avengers Infinity War playing Thanos. However, Deadpool, despite being a Marvel Comics character, is not actually part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe occupied by the Avengers the Guardians of the Galaxy, and Doctor Strange, amongst other characters. As a matter of fact, when Deadpool was first released in 2016, Disney did not actually own the rights to the character, or X-Men, or the Fantastic Four, despite the fact that the Walt Disney Studios, or rather the Walt Disney Company, bought the Marvel franchise, both the comic books and the Marvel Studios, the movie studio. But... In the years since, Disney actually has acquired 20th Century Fox, so it does technically own Deadpool, X-Men, the Fantastic Four, and some other extraneous Marvel characters that they didn't own while acquiring the, the Marvel name. However, despite this, Deadpool is not part of that Marvel Cinematic Universe that I just mentioned. At least not yet. But even still, I don't think Marvel fans or even comic book movie fans will be disappointed by Deadpool 2. I know I certainly wasn't. As a matter of fact, Deadpool, again, played by Ryan Reynolds, is a little... Ah, too much for me. I I still am not completely adjusted to Ryan Reynolds' sense of humor. I still think he lacks some basic comic timing as well as actually some charisma. I see it this way. Not everybody else does. But I do have to say that Ryan Reynolds actually did feel a lot or did seem to feel a lot more comfortable in this role than he was in the original one. I think now, almost like a well-worn sneaker, he's kind of getting his footing in this film, and he feels a lot more comfortable. And I thought that actually a lot of the a lot of the jokes that Wade Wilson slash Deadpool made in this film felt fresher, felt less hackneyed. The only ones I didn't really like were the ones where Deadpool breaks the fourth wall and mentions something about the movie, uh, the movie's casting and some of the 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 plots that felt like lazy writing, which he actually does state in one at one point. But what I really liked about Deadpool 2 was not only the, the writing being sharper, but also the fact that because Deadpool has created this X-Force, which is slated to be another movie in the Deadpool slash X-Men universe, but I liked the fact that there were other people in this movie that shared the spotlight with Deadpool and kind of took a lot of the, um, I I shouldn't say spotlight away from them, even though they did, but either way, the side characters in this film were played extremely well. I especially loved the newest member of the X-Force, whose name is Domino, who's played by an African-American actress who I wasn't familiar with before. At least I recognized her face, but I haven't seen her in many other movies. Her name is Zazie Beetz. And those of you who are TV watchers will probably know her best from her role in Atlanta, which is the Donald Glover uh, TV series, which is doing really well. I actually have not actually seen a single episode of Atlanta, but I know it's won a couple of Emmys and it's gotten some great reviews. But I loved her in this movie. Domino is a woman who, or a superhero, whose superpower is good luck. And I thought that not only did Zazy Beats have a lot of charisma and confidence that Ryan Reynolds actually lacks, but also her scenes in this film were absolutely amazing. I also really liked the young, troubled youth in this film, whose name is Russell, and he's he's an uh, he's a mutant 
who is not part of the X-Men, very much like Deadpool, but is also a troubled youth like Deadpool was. He's played by a young New Zealander, uh, New Zealand um, actor by the name of Julian Dennison, who I remember seeing from the refreshingly funny Hunt for the Wilder People, which came out two years ago. And even though it's been two years and I've seen hundreds of other movies since then, I remember that movie well, and I remember Julian Dennison in that film. And he was probably hired for this movie movie because of Hunt for the Wilder People, but he's really good in this film. And there are also some returning performances by Mo- Morena Bakarin, who plays Wade Wilson's love interest and I think fiance Vanessa. There's also, uh, let's see, th- there's also uh, T.J. Miller, who plays Wade Wilson's best friend and bartender Weasel. And I thought that Deadpool was going to make a crack about T.J. Miller being in the Emoji movie. That would have been a great fourth wall breaking opportunity, but unfortunately that was missed. And also you have Leslie Uggams who plays the the, the blind woman who is Deadpool's roommate, Blind Al. So they're all returned here. There's a little bit of old, a little bit of new here. But what I really liked about it was I thought the writing was sharper than the original. I thought the plot was better than the original. And I was I was extremely impressed by Deadpool 2, much more than I thought I would be. And it gets my rating of a knockout. It's not better than Avengers Infinity War, but I liked the fact that it kind of took what it established from the original Deadpool movie. I'm and year old man that walked in there to get his high school diploma. It was very hard for me, but Miss Araceli, she gave me direction. At age 47, Marco finished his high school diploma. 50% of getting your high school diploma is walking through those doors. The other 50% is doing the work. No one gets a diploma alone. If you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. That's finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras in many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, Old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Book Club, a movie that will definitely not appeal to any fans, or many fans, I should say, of Avengers Infinity War, Deadpool 2, or any of those high-adrenaline, high-octane comic book movies. But for those of you who are not into those movies at all, Book Club might be your cup of tea. It's a movie about four lifelong friends, all of whom are older women, played by Diane Keaton, Jane Fonda, Candace Bergen, and Mary Steenburgen. And these friends have their lives forever changed after reading Fifty Shades of Grey in their monthly book club. And this is basically a movie about four women who have, well, seen a lot in their lives. It's not established what exact age they are, and I could have looked up their ages in particular. I know that Jane Fonda is 80 now, um, and I wouldn't normally bring that up, except she looks amazing for her age. The other three women look good for their age as well, but yeah, Jane Fonda <laughs> has is, is drinking some kind of water. <laughs> Maybe it's not water, but in any event... There's one woman who has never been married and just has immersed herself in her life as a hotel maven. That's Vivian, who's played by Jane Fonda. There's another woman, Sharon, played by Candace Bergen, who is a 
federal judge who was once married but is, as of this movie, divorced. There's also Diane Keaton, who plays a woman named Diane, if you can believe it. I think that's probably the first time she's played a woman named Diane, who plays a widower whose adult children are nagging her to move to Arizona to be closer to them because they're worried about her health, even though she's Diane Keaton and she's doing fine, despite, well, she's well, she's younger than Jane Fonda, but either way, um, she's 71 years old now, and, well, uh, she's doing fine, particularly considering my grandparents are 71. And finally, there's Carol, who's married to a man who's still alive, She's played by Mary Steenburgen, and her husband is played by Craig T. Nelson. And even though they are married, they face a little bit of a a struggle in the sense that there is a spark that's been lacking from their marriage. And as this movie plays it, it is apparently the first time this has happened. So you have four women who are all friends, and other than that, they don't have much in common. In fact, all of them are in drastically different places in their lives in terms of relationships. And I did like some of the the subplots in the film. Like, for instance, Diane Keaton begins, or Diane Keaton's character begins a relationship with an airline pilot named Mitchell, who's played by Andy Garcia. And despite the fact that you have (laughs) Michael Corleone's wife in The Godfather, who's having a relationship with Sonny Corleone's son in The Godfather Part 3, I kind of put that Godfather connection aside, at least temporarily, and actually thought the love story between the two of them was not only legitimate, but also sweet. I also really liked uh, Candace Bergen's, or Candace Bergen's character's um, trial with the website Bumble, where even though she's single and proud, she feels as though there's some connection she could be making with other men. And she begins dating other men through Bumble. And there's actually, even though I I thought "Eh, it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a connection or a little bit of product placement for Bumble. I, I still thought the part where Candace Bergen is actually photographing herself for Bumble. I thought that was surprisingly funny. And there are two men whom she dates in this film who I won't give away. They are pretty famous. But it actually was surprising to see them in the film, uh, of course, make an appearance. I wasn't... Uh, actually, I... The subplot I was probably the least impressed with, only because I've seen it several times before, was where Mary Steenburgen and Craig T. Nelson are trying to rekindle their romantic relationship by taking dance lessons. I just feel like I've seen that in so many movies, including with the dance lessons, that I didn't really need it here. And last but not least, you have Jane Fonda, who is actually rekindling a long-lost love in Arthur, who's played by Don Johnson, who is the one that not only got away, but she kind of pushed away in her career pursuits. So I, I thought, yeah, the Mary Steenburgen subplot didn't need to be there. The other three subplots involving these older women finding love, I thought were legitimate and sweet. But the one thing that irked me about this film is the fact that they start to rekindle their romantic relationships after reading Fifty Shades of Grey. Unlike Bumble, I thought this was shameful product placement for Fifty Shades of Grey, both the book, especially the book, but also the movie. And I thought there would be kind of a wink and a um, breaking the fourth wall nod to the fact that Don Johnson is in this movie as Jane Fonda's love interest, and his daughter, Dakota Johnson, was in the movie Fifty Shades of Grey. I thought they would have made that connection, but even if they had, I think that would have been one more thing I would have criticized because they don't really allude to anything in Fifty Shades of Grey. You know, I think it would have been one thing if these women had actually practiced the bondage. It would have been disturbing as hell, but at least it would have been something instead of them just trying to rekindle their romantic relationships in the most hackneyed ways. Meeting people online, taking dance lessons, that sort of thing. But I I just... I I also didn't really appreciate the fact that Fifty Shades of Grey was in this film. They could have created a fictional book 
w- which they read, which they could have incorporated into this this plot. And interestingly enough, despite the fact that the movie is called Book Club, this movie is actually not based on a book, which I find pretty interesting. And also, I was really disturbed by Jane Fonda saying about Fifty Shades of Grey's popularity, and I quote, 50 million people can't be wrong. Oh, yes, they can. In Fifty Shades of Grey's case, they're, they are. And the 52 million people who voted for our current president, they could be wrong too, and they were as well, if you'd allow me to put on my political hat as well. So I didn't appreciate the fact that Book Club gave a lot of product placement to Fifty Shades of Grey. In fact, the entire trilogy, whether that was intended or not, it wasn't needed. They could have done without this, but... I thought three out of the four subplots were worthy, and I I give this movie a a checkout. I think it's a movie that might be worth renting, but probably not worth seeing on the big screen. In the wake of a disaster, what one thing can you send that will help people the most? A blanket, a tent, a sandbag, a doctor. Actually, if you send a monetary donation, you send all these things. Even a small donation can make a big impact and can quickly become exactly what people affected by disaster need most. In the wake of a hurricane, your monetary donation can make a huge difference to those in need. To donate, visit supporthurricanerelief.org. That's supporthurricanerelief.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Greetings and welcome to the beautiful Me Club. Save the date, Saturday. September 29th for the fourth annual Evolution of Hip Hop Festival. Hi, I am Yvette and I am the creative director for the Hip Hop Festival. Please join the Somerville Arts Council, Somerville Media Center, the Somerville Line, What's the Word Radio to celebrate this wonderful event. Saturday, September 29th, 2018 from 3 to 7 p.m. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing is Life of the Party. This is the latest starring Melissa McCarthy, who plays a woman who, after her husband abruptly asks for a divorce, she returns to college, in fact, the college that her daughter is attending, in order to complete her degree. The movie is was co-written by Melissa McCarthy and her husband, Ben Falcone, who also serves as director. And when Ben Falcone has been directing his wife, the results have been hit or miss. I do think Ben Falcone is a talented writer, director, and sometimes actor, although a lot of the films in which in, in which is excuse me, the films in which he has acted, he's had pretty small parts. But Tammy was probably his biggest miss so far with Melissa McCarthy. He had a follow-up to that, The Boss, which I actually liked. I actually thought it was pretty funny. Life of the Party is probably not as good or as original as The Boss. But it was actually better than Tammy. The the only thing I really didn't like about Life of the Party is Melissa McCarthy kind of... There are some parts of this movie that are a little bit unsettling, and I will get into those later. But the minute you see Melissa McCarthy, you realize that she has Edie McClurg's wardrobe. Edie McClurg is the actress who is a former groundling who is has been in several John Hughes movies and is probably best known for being the principal secretary in Ferris Bueller's Day Off who said the immortal, they think he's a righteous dude. And when I saw this movie and saw Melissa McCarthy wear those kind of Edie McClurg clothing, I, I, I began thinking to myself, okay, In this movie, it's established that Melissa McCarthy's character, whose name, by the way, is Deanna, has left or was last in college 23 years prior to this movie, which is set in present day. So we'll assume 2018, which means she left college in 1995. Women who went to college in the 90s do not dress like Edie McClurg. Ever. I, I'm, I'm willing to bet that. I, But in spite of that hang-up, I, I, of course, like Melissa McCarthy in this movie. I think she gives it her all. I also thought she gave it her all in, in the movie Tammy. The, the thing that was wrong with Tammy was not her performance in the film. It was, of course, different from the movies in which she plays someone with self-confidence, like Bridesmaids. But in this movie, she's kind of middle of the road. She's not quite as self-loathing as... 
her Tammy character, but she also isn't quite as confident as her bridesmaid character or even her character in The Boss either. She's kind of middle of the road, and her life takes a, a turn for the worst when after her, dropping her daughter off at college, uh, her daughter, by the way, is named Jennifer, and she's played by, um, oh, excuse me, a, I'm just trying to look this up. Yes, um, her, her daughter in this movie is played by an actress named Debbie Ryan, and Debbie Ryan actually, I thought, just a side note, she is a dead ringer for Jenna Fisher. So if there's ever a movie or a TV show that comes out that stars Jenna Fisher, this actress, Debbie Ryan, should probably play her, her either her daughter or her younger sister. But I, I thought, you know, even though she doesn't look a thing like Melissa McCarthy, I, I was very... I thought she was very believable as Melissa McCarthy's daughter. But in any event, Deanna is actually dumped in this film by almost as soon as she drops her daughter Jennifer off to college by her husband, who basically says as soon as they're pulling out of the uh, out of the driveway of her of her sorority house, I want a divorce. And he, he calls it being transparent but of course that there's being transparent and there's dropping the ball and it turns out that this husband is leaving Melissa McCarthy's character for a character who's about the same age but is better looking and her name in the in the movie is Marcy and she's played by Julie Bowen who yes she's very <laughs> she's very pretty but of course you know you, you immediately hate the husband for leaving Melissa McCarthy, as you probably should. But also, the actor who plays Melissa McCarthy's soon-to-be ex-husband is an actor by the name of Matt Walsh, who is not an especially great-looking guy. And when you see him leave Melissa McCarthy's character for Julie Bowen's character, you're thinking less, how could you, and more... Julie Bowen, how could you marry a guy who looks like this? But I'm just saying, but it's for plot point's sake. But as the movie tells you, Melissa McCarthy's character did actually attend the same college as her husband Dan, but unlike her husband Dan, she did not actually finish. She got pregnant during her junior or at the end of her junior year of college and didn't return for her senior year. So she finally, after this divorce happens, goes back to her daughter's college, which was actually her alma mater, to finish up her final year. And from there, hilarity kind of ensues. This movie did actually remind me thematically of Back to School, except instead of this self-made millionaire, you have this eh, middle-class woman who's coming back. So th there isn't the money factor here where she has as as much money as she wants she can basically do whatever she wants unlike in back to school but there are certain themes that come up in this movie and what i did appreciate about the film which i appreciate about all the good college movies is it didn't make college out to be this 24-hour orgy there there are college movies i've said this before that try to out animal house animal house and they fail miserably. They just become in this really hackneyed um, class of college films. So I thought there was some originality there. When I was talking about the disturbing parts or when Melissa McCarthy begins a relationship with a guy about her daughter Jennifer's age, whose name is Jack, who's played by Luke Benward. And once you actually see them hook up, I I just felt icky <laughs> watching that. I was thinking to myself, Melissa McCarthy's character, you should know better. Eventually, she does break it off with him, and that's not a spoiler. But what I wanted to see from this film is also a little bit, not only of Melissa McCarthy in college, but also after college. Now that she's gotten her degree, what is she going to do? And the movie didn't left out that part as well, which I thought would have made it a more original movie. But as it stands, I give it my rating of a checkout. I did think Melissa McCarthy was funny. I thought the actress who played her daughter was also really good and played off well. Hi, I'm Danica Patrick. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing, but not every child gets to be carefree. 
one in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. This breaks my heart, and it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and gives it to families in need. To help, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. A mighty feast of hot, steaming music. Brought to you in stereo by bostonfreeradio.com. I love those real six sides. They're the ones that move me. A thinly blown, neurotic toe. Intensify and groove me. All this and more on Unpacked Music. Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Show Dogs, which is not to be confused with Snow Dogs, which is a movie that came out 17 years ago starring Cuba Gooding Jr., which you probably haven't seen. So if you've ever watched Miss Congeniality, the the movie starring Sandra Bullock, and thought to yourself, you know, this movie should have more dogs, then Show Dogs is the movie for you. But my guess is that only 5% of my listeners, if that, and that's probably a generous estimation, feel that way. But that's essentially what Show Dogs is. Show Dogs is a movie about talking dogs, and it's like miscongeniality with dogs. Let me explain. It's a movie about Max, a macho, solitary Rottweiler, who's voiced in this movie by Chris Ludacris Bridges, And he is ordered to go undercover as a primped show dog in a prestigious dog show, along with his human partner, played by Will Arnett, to avert a disaster from happening. So this is a movie where the dogs talk. There are real dogs in this movie. They're not CGI dogs, even though there are some animals who aren't domesticated dogs who actually are CGI characters. And you can tell immediately that they are CGI. But even though the humans can't talk to the dogs, or at least the humans and dogs don't converse like Animal Farm, the dogs talk to one another by using real dogs and moving their mouths with computers. And it is a pretty disturbing special effect, especially with this Rottweiler Max. And also, I was waiting for this movie to be funny, and ultimately, it never really was. It is a dumb buddy comedy that will probably not even appeal to kids. I guess it might appeal to dog lovers, but as I was watching this film, I was thinking less about the voice actors in this film, who I actually thought were pretty good. I thought that... Of course, Ludacris was a pretty good fit for the dog, Max. And as I was watching it, I I like my voice actors to be anonymous, but I was thinking to myself, A, who is this? And I didn't figure it out until the credits rolled. But B, this is a good fit for a Rottweiler, this voice. But I just wish he was in a better movie. There are also dogs in this movie that are voiced by uh, Stanley Tutri. Excuse me, Stanley Tucci, who plays a prissy male dog by the name of Felipe. There's also Gabri- Gabrielle Fluffy Iglesias, who plays a dog named Sprinkles. And there's also a female dog in this movie who's, whose name is Daisy, who guess who the love interest of, guess who Daisy's love interest is. And she is voiced by Jordan Sparks. Amongst the The human actors in this movie are, as I said, Will Arnett, who plays an FBI agent named Frank, and he also develops a love interest with another agent who's more experienced in grooming dogs and also tracking down dog shows, whose name is Maddie, and she's played by Natasha Leone. Now, it's one thing to see voice actors like Ludacris and Stanley Tucci do the voices of these characters. But as I was watching Will Arnett and Natasha Leone or Leone do this movie or act in this movie, I was thinking to myself, you guys do not need to do this movie. So either you lost a bet or 
you are you thought this movie was going to be better than it ultimately was. And to Will Arnett and Natasha Leone's credit, they do the best they can with this film. And I thought actually the chemistry between the two of them was pretty good. But ultimately, it really wasn't all that funny. As a matter of fact, there were only a couple of scenes at which I laughed. There was one scene where this dog, Felipe, who's a, a small dog, I, I can't tell you what breed because I forgot, but again, it's, it's the dog that's voiced by Stanley Tucci. I, I remember him going into F, uh, FBI agent Frank's office, and, or rather his hotel room, and going into his closet and dressing up in dog pajamas. That I thought was funny. That was probably one of the only parts that genuinely made me laugh. But all the other lines in this movie, all the bad puns, just really fell flat. And I was waiting for this movie to at least be cute enough for me to minimally enjoy. And it didn't come. I just thought it was a a cliche of buddy cop movies Talking dog movies like Marmaduke and, of course, as I mentioned before, Miss Congeniality just at the Westminster-like dog show. And this is all to track down a criminal who is stealing exotic pets, including one panda that is obviously CGI. And you can tell the difference just by looking at the dogs in this film and also looking at that panda and the tricks he could do. No trainer could ever probably train a panda to do, particularly in a movie that's probably not more than $20 million in budget. Although, as I mentioned in my first segment, What's Topping the Box Office, I don't actually know the budget of show dogs. And that is probably not a very good sign, but I I could be wrong about that. But either way, I just think that kids today, even little kids, might like this movie, but I would like to think that Children are more sophisticated than this film. And also, the movie doesn't really know, even though it's rated PG, whether it wants to appeal to kids or to their families. If they wanted to appeal to just kids, I could respect that. I wouldn't necessarily like the movie, but at least I would respect its target audience. But there is an embarrassing scene in this film where... The the Rottweiler Max, who's a street dog, who's in this movie p- posing as a Westminster dog show candidate, actually gets a bikini wax, and it is an incredibly stupid scene. The, the dog screams, and I actually thought it was scary looking rather than funny, but maybe that will make little kids laugh. It seemed to be something to appease to the adults or the kids who are bringing their children to see this film. At least I'm speculating, but it's one of those instances where this do- the, the, where this movie, Show Dogs, tried to please everyone and ended up pleasing no one, and it certainly didn't please me, and that's why it gets my rating of a flunk out. It's not a movie that offended me, but it also didn't really impress me. I thought maybe that the, the effects on the dogs and making them talk was impressive enough, but unfortunately, the story here, which was written by Max Botkin and Mark Hyman, was just not good enough. The director of this movie, by the way, is Raja Gosnell, who actually has been editing a number of films over the years, a lot of classics, including Pretty Woman and Home Alone. But in terms of directing, he's directed the two Smurfs films and a number of other films as well, including, not surprisingly, Beverly Hills Chihuahua. Why was the basketball court all wet? Because the players kept dribbling on it. (laughs) The dad joke. Corny, groan-worthy, but also one of the simplest ways to share a moment with your kids. What did the buffalo say when he dropped his son off for school? Bye, son. (laughs) So take a moment to make your kid laugh, because dad jokes rule. Make your kid laugh today. Go to fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Hey, 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 it's Genevieve, a.k.a. Miss Fab 617. And it's your girl, Crystal, a.k.a. The Crystal Lens. We're coming to you from our new show called Boston Come Come Through. Through. We'll be bringing you the latest and greatest things happening in and around Boston. We'll be talking what? Black-owned businesses, social events, what? And the Black Experience. How's that sound, Genevieve? I love it. Dig it. Tune in every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio. Boston, come through. Come listen. 
Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And just as a reminder, you are listening to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio, watching Words on Film on SCAT V or some community access TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast. And to them, I say thank you. Or you're watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, this time on my own personal page because we're having technical difficulties with the other camera in here that broadcasts on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. But either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is a documentary called RBG. What does RBG stand for? Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And this movie is, of course, a look at the life and work of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Not only her influence on the law, but also her surprising and unexpected influence on pop culture as of late, especially since the publication of the book The Notorious RBG and also her counterculture appeal, especially in this day where not there aren't a lot of heroes in Washington, or at least not a lot of heroes we hear about on the news. But a lot can be said about Ruth Bader Ginsburg and also the fact that she is the second justice on the, or excuse me, the second female justice on the U.S. Supreme Court. The first, of course, was Sandra Day O'Connor. And you get actually a lot of really interesting interviews in this film from Ms. Ginsburg herself, as well as Gloria Steinem, Nina Totenberg, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's late husband, who actually got a fair amount of interviews for this film before unfortunately passing on of stomach cancer years ago and yeah this movie tells you just about everything you probably need to know about Ms. Ginsburg how she got started in law how she or her testifying before the Supreme Court long before she was a justice and also her unexpected pop culture uh, appeal these days and how she actually goes to campuses and actually sells out wherever she speaks. And the the movie also delves into her relationship with other justices, including Antonin Scalia, who, unlike Ruth Bader Ginsburg, was the more conservative member of the Supreme Court. So this movie has a lot in it, and I don't quite know exactly where to start. I really liked where this movie started, where the movie ended, I loved the, the the graphics that this movie used, as well as it's pretty much it's it's use of archive footage. And this movie is directed co-directed by Julie Cohen, who has directed such previous documentaries as American Veteran, The Sturgeon Queens, and The Unforgettable Hampton Family, none of which I've actually seen. The Unforgettable Hampton Family is a documentary that was a a, a short that aired on TV. And as of yet, Ms. Cohen has not actually been nominated for an Oscar yet. She's been nominated for... Um, Best Documentary, actually at the Cleveland International Film Festival, and that was actually this year. She's also received nominations for the Los Angeles Jewish Film Festival, the Miami Film Festival, for, again, RBG here. And I would, again, I'm I'm very bad at predicting what documentaries will be or should be nominated for Oscars, but I'd be willing to bet that RBG is at least a viable contender for this uh, or nomination. And I should also note that the documentary is also co-directed by Betsy West, and this is her directorial debut as a filmmaker. Before this, she has produced a number of other documentaries, including The Lavender Scare, The 4% Film's Gender Problems, and also Makers, Women Who Make America Video Archive. So these are two filmmakers who have had a lot of experience in the documentary genre. Probably not not an extent. They've had an extensive amount of experience. And what more is there to say about this documentary? It tells you a lot. It has a lot of great interviews with various people in Ruth Bader Ginsburg's life, including actually President Clinton, who appointed Ruth Bader Ginsburg into the U.S. Supreme Court in 1993. And it also delves into some of the triumphs 
not only of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's stint, or rather her career in the U.S. Supreme Court, but also much before she was appointed to the Supreme Court. And it also gives a little bit of information about some of the mistakes she's made in the Supreme Court. Like, for instance, before Donald Trump became elected president, she actually let it slip that she thought that Donald Trump was unfit for office. It's not that she had many people who... she. It's not that she had no one who disagreed with her, but she had plenty of people who did. And the movie delves into, well, the, the ramifications of making such a statement. And it also shows that she also retracted that statement and apologized, which says a lot about her character. So Ruth Bader, excuse me, RBG is a documentary which I give my rating of a knockout, and I've got about a minute and a half to tell you more about what I think of this film, but as I said, it's very well researched. It makes a lot of great use of interviews as well as archive footage, both video archive footage and audio archive footage, and this is great not only for people who are uh, fans of her cult of personality, but also people who are probably not as familiar with her legacy. I would imagine liberals would love this film immensely. Conservatives, eh, maybe not so much, but already this movie has been racking up a lot of nominations. As I said, it's been nominated for Best Documentary and Best Direction at the Cleveland International Film Festival. It's also been nominated for the Miami Film Festival for Best Documentary and for the same awards at the Sarasota Film Festival and the Wisconsin Film Festival. And again, these are, oh, actually, they, I stand corrected on that. She, uh, this movie has been nominated for Best Documentary at Cleveland and Miami. It's actually won Best Documentary at the Sarasota Film Festival and the Wisconsin Film Festival. So that's a pretty good start. Uh, and I would hope that a movie like this would be nominated for Best Documentary. But as I've said before, I am so wrong about the documentary category because more often than not, I'd be lucky if I see two films that were nominated for that category. But as I've said before, as I've got five seconds left to go before the break, this movie has a very good chance and I'd like to see it nominated. Come on, smile. Oh, honey, he's still not smiling. Maybe he's not a smiler. Yeah, maybe he's just not a happy baby. Maybe he's just being a boy. Or maybe he's teething. Maybe it's just a phase. Maybe he has autism and we can definitely do something to help. Maybe is all you need to find out more about autism. No big, joyful smiles by six months is one early sign. Learn the others at autismspeaks.org slash signs. Brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And now that I've reviewed the five movies that I'm going to be reviewing for you for this show, it's now time for my final segment, What's Coming Up Next? These are the big films, unless stated otherwise, that are coming out in theaters near you, unless stated otherwise, this coming weekend. And the biggest movie that's coming out in theaters this weekend, which is going to challenge and maybe succeed Deadpool 2 for the number one slot at in the box office for this coming weekend, is the movie Solo, a Star Wars story. And this is a movie uh, which details Han Solo's adventures before the events of Episode 4, probably after the events of Episode 3, but I can't entirely confirm that, but during an adventure into a dark criminal underworld, Han Solo meets his future co-pilot Chewbacca and encounters Lando Calrissian years before joining the Rebellion. You might remember in the first three Star Wars movies, that is episode four through six, Han Solo was of course played by Harrison Ford and Lando Calrissian was played by Billy D. Williams. This time you have Alden Iron Rick, who's playing the young Han Solo, and Donald Glover playing the young Lando Calrissian. And Alden, I, 
Ihenrick is a very familiar face. He's been in such movies as Hail Caesar. He was in Beautiful Creatures. He was in the movie Stoker. And I know there was one other movie he was in that I've seen. He was in Blue Jasmine, which was a Woody Allen film. There was another one, Running Wild, which I haven't seen. But either way, he's one of those actors who, if you've seen his face, you've probably, you could probably identify what films he was in. But Solo, A Star Wars Story is a movie I definitely will see for you next show. And I'll, or rather, I'll see it this weekend and I'll review it for you for next show. Whether or not I'm going to like it, I can never guarantee that. But I am a little concerned ever since... Disney bought the rights to Star Wars from 20th Century Fox before buying the studio outright, that Disney is maybe oversaturating Star Wars into theaters a little bit too much. And I would probably have preferred Solo be released later, probably after Episode Nine, not before it. But in any event, there's nothing I could do to stop the Star Wars juggernaut. The only people that can stop that is the audience who go to pay go pay to see it. But I'm not saying that the movie's going to be bad. But I am going to see it this weekend. And I'll let you know what I think come next week. Another movie that's coming out in theaters, hopefully near me, but I can't guarantee it, is a movie called How to Talk to Girls at Parties. This sounds like something I could definitely use. But this is a movie about an alien touring the galaxy. I wouldn't have expected that from the title. Breaks away from her group and meets two young inhabitants of the most dangerous place in the universe. Wait for it. The London suburb of Croydon. This is a movie that stars Elle Fanning, Nicole Kidman, neither of whom are British, interestingly enough. It also stars Ruth Wilson and Stephen Campbell Moore. And let me just look this up. This movie might be based on a book. It actually is based on a short story by none other than Neil Gaiman. And the screenplay was co-written by John Cameron Mitchell, who also directs this film. The other co-writer is Philippa Gosselet. This movie looks interesting, particularly given the title. Can't guarantee whether it's good or not, but if it's coming out in the theater near me, I will definitely see it, and I will let you know what I think come next week's show. The other movie that's coming out in theaters that looks interesting is a movie called The Gospel According to Andre, which is a documentary, and it's a movie about a man by the name of Andre Leon Talley, and it takes you from the segregated American South to the fashion capitals of the world, where Mr. Talley is an operatic fashion editor and the movie details his life and career. And it includes appearances by Anna Wintour, Mark Jacobs, Tom Ford, Bethan Hardison, Valentino, and Manola Bianek. So for those of you who are close to the fashion world, unlike me, you will probably recognize these names instantly. I don't, but the fact that you have a black man who is part of the burgeoning fashion industry where you don't see a lot of black people, let alone men. I'm very interested to see this film. I will not at all identify with any of the high fashion designers, but it looks like an interesting film and I will hopefully see it if it comes out in the theater near me. If not, I'll wait until it does and I will let you know what I think come next week's show. But that just about wraps things up with this edition, this week's edition of Words on Film. Of course, I am your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and the views and opinions expressed on Words on Film about movies or otherwise are solely those of your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, i.e. me. They do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees who are working at the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. And of course, Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I am very excited to speak the, to talk about films with you this week. I'll be even more excited next week. So until then, this is Dan Burke saying I'll see you at the movies. <laughs>